Okay. Part two. Questions to ponder. Now, we had this in a previous week, but I think the Lord wants us to have more of this. And questions to ponder, points to ponder. If you go online on davidherobedian.com right now, you can actually download a teaching off the library section. And uh, all that stuff is still available for free right now, all the videos and everything else. Eventually, we're going to put it on Amazon, on Kindle. In fact, on the subject of tongues, went up today. First ebook on Kindle. So it's like a 99 cent download. Send it to your friends. <laughs> Amen. Okay, question. Do you, do you, just point to yourself. Do I, do I, do I believe in the present day ministry of Jesus? To heal the sick and to cast out demons. Do you believe that? Yes. 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 Peter Lord, author of Hearing God, <clears throat> writes, We practice daily what we really believe. Everything else is just religious rhetoric. Just religious talk. Amen? Amen. Or ouch. Amen? Amen. 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 Okay, that being said, I want to ask some questions. And this teaching was actually born out of questions that a prison chaplain asked me one day. She said, David, she says, why do you preach on healing? Why do you preach on deliverance? Why do you do these things and disrupt what goes on in our peaceable meetings in the body of Christ here? And I thought to myself, well, bless your heart. And you know what? She was a chaplain that loved the Lord and was a mighty woman of God. And had actually done street evangelism when she was young in the Lord. But then she got into seminary. And if you come out of seminary with any faith at all, it's a miracle. You know, I know I went to seminary. And I went to a spirit-filled seminary. And it still can be academic overachievement. And then cause you to have all this knowledge and data in your head. That will cause you, if you're not careful as a teacher within the body of Christ. To serve up crock pots of meat that nobody ordered during the service. We have a tendency to know how many steps are in the temple. The colors, the symbology of everything from A to Z. We can quote from Genesis to Revolution and all the way around again. And if it's not under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, it's just knowledge that puffs up. But we want love that builds up. Amen. Amen? Amen. So here's what I wrote to her, and it birthed this teaching. And I'm going to share something with you. When you are asked questions, sometimes the Lord is preparing you for something for the future. And many of the trials and the tribulations that I experienced during 19 years, 6 months, and a week of incarceration were really in preparation for. The other thing is God also deals with us in our character development during those times. Almost every teaching the Lord has given me has been birthed in some sort of either struggle or by revelation, and when I would release it, there would be opposition. So I thank God for the people that asked me questions, challenged me in my faith, and I bless that woman of God and also the many other men and women of God who I submitted to the authority of that were instruments to teach me because it drove me back to the Lord to find out what the Word said on the matter. Tonight, we're going to look at what the Word says on some matters. And how many would agree with the Word tonight? Amen? Amen. The rest of you? Mm -hmm. Okay. We're going to agree with what the Word says. Two, two ways to read the Scriptures. Exegetically and eisegetically. By the way, those are theological terms that come from seminary school. Exegetically means to read out of the scriptures what they say. If the scriptures say something different than what you or I believe, do we change the scriptures to come into alignment with what we believe already? Or do we allow the scriptures to change us? We allow the scriptures to change us. Eisegetically is reading into the scriptures what you already believe and interpret them according to your beliefs. So when you find something in the Word that's contrary to what you believe, you say, well, that's not what it really means, because I already know what it means. Because I was raised up in this denomination or that denomination, or I was taught this, or this is my life experience, so that must not be what it means. One day, I actually grabbed a Bible before a congregation of prisoners, and I took a pair of scissors, and I said, 
what do you believe about this? Do you believe it's still for today? And they said, well, you know, no, we don't believe. We believe that passed away with the apostles. I said, great. I just began to cut it out and threw it on the ground. You can't cut up a Bible. Why? You just did. <laughs> we don't need that. Well, it's church history. Yeah, but what's it really matter? There's no, applic there's no application for it today. It's just a storybook. What's the difference between that and a novel? And I cut out another thing that they didn't believe. And I'd actually pre-cut out a whole lot of things, and then I showed them the Bible, and I don't have one, because I believe everything in here. <laughs> Amen? Amen? I didn't cut any of it out, and neither did God, because He wanted us to have it. And I began to flip through the pages that had all the stuff cut out of it. I said, what's that do to the Word of God? And they began to look at me, and some got a little bit testy over that. <laughs> because I defiled the word of God. And then I went ahead and thought, for shock evangelism value, why don't I just do this? And I turned around and I said, and I threw the Bible across the room in the chapel. Ooh. And it hit the ground. <laughs> and they were ready to fight and defend the faith for what I'd done by defiling the word. And I said, wait a second, I'm just doing what you do every day of your lives. You throw the Bible out the door for your own doctrine, your own personal thing, when you do this. And I began to name the sins that were in the congregation. Now, all of a sudden, it was no longer about what I had done to this paperback Bible that, by the way, was already missing a section out of it. I didn't tell you that. And it was going to be thrown away, and I found it on a trash can. Does that make you feel a little better about the story at all? Okay. Yes. And you religious folks on video? Yeah, yeah. You've thrown it around too with your lifestyle. Okay, let's start doing the whole word. Okay. Anyway, at that point, there was a shift that took place on the compound. Now, I was about a year old in Christ when that had happened, and I wasn't really mature in a lot of the things of God like I am now, and I'm not as mature now as I will be 20 more years from now, Jesus tarries, and I didn't do everything right. I was kind of like impetuous Peter, who walked on water and sank, cut off a centurion's ear, thinking he was doing God a service, ended up denying Christ three times, right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes we do some things when we're impetuous, but our heart's right, but our actions aren't necessarily perfect. We don't do it always with such grace as we mature in the Lord. Anyway, it shifted things on the compound and put me in a snake pit with religious folks. And uh, that's where many of the teachings were born out. But on that day, when that chaplain asked me those questions, I went to the Word of God and I created what I refer to now as points to ponder or questions to ponder. Do you believe in the present day ministry of healing the sick in Jesus' name? Remember, we really, belief is doing what we believe. So we practice daily, 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 not occasionally. You know what the difference between a successful person is and an unsuccessful person is? They've looked at it statistically. A successful person practices daily what the unsuccessful person practices only occasionally. One of the reasons why I am not a bodybuilder and in a magazine on a picture is because I only practice occasionally what a bodybuilder does daily. But I do like to heal the sick. And I really enjoy casting out demons in the name of Jesus. Amen? Because I practice that daily. Even if I have to do it on myself. Okay? Amen. Okay. It's a joke. But... Probably. Sometimes you need some self-deliverance. Yes. They say statistically, I don't know if you, you know this, but statistically only about 15% of the body of Christ is really free. The other 85% is kind of bound. Got some hitchhikers. Okay? Don't want to startle you with that. But look at some of the things you've done this week and tell me you're free. Okay? Tell the truth. Shame the devil. Okay. Question. When you minister healing to the sick... What example or what model do you use, exercise, or follow? Let me clarify or qualify that. Do you follow the model and example taught in your church? Well, that's how Uncle Bill does it. Well, that's how we do it at all denomination. Well, that's how we did it at the revival. Or do you follow 
the biblical role model, an example of Jesus. Anybody know Jesus? <laughs> Amen. And the disciples or apostles as taught or role modeled in the four gospels and the book of Acts. Question to ponder. Is there a difference? Yes. Thought to ponder. Jesus and the disciples never once prayed for the sick. What? How can that be, David? Let me explain. Biblically. Instead, they healed the sick. Yes. We're getting ready to come up a notch tonight. You know, if you go from here to Singapore, you get your plane off just two degrees, you miss Singapore. Sometimes when you get your spiritual focus off just two degrees, get it off of Jesus, just a little bit, you'll miss your healing, you'll miss your deliverance. Peter was walking on water, had his eyes on Jesus. Took him off just a couple of degrees, began to look, and he sank, didn't he? We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to keep our eyes Amen. on what the Word says and use the biblical model. Yes. Yes. Greater works will you do than these, Jesus says, because I go to the Father. Is that experience in your life yet? Amen? amen? The book of Acts is not the climax, it's the flashpoint. There's no amen at the end of the book of Acts. Matthew ends with amen. Mark ends with amen. Luke ends with amen. John ends with amen. The book of Acts has no amen in it, but Romans ends with amen. 1 Corinthians ends with amen. 2 Corinthians ends with Revelation ends with amen. There's no amen on the book of Acts at the end of chapter 28. I believe, it's not by accident, I believe there's no amen at the end of the chapter of the book of Acts that the book closes because it's not been closed by the Lord yet. We are living in Acts chapter 29 and it's being written through your life and mine as the Holy Spirit continues to perform His acts. It's not the acts of the apostles, it's the acts of the Holy Spirit who changes not and he did it through the apostles. He also did it through Stephen, who was not an apostle. Yes. He also did it through Apollos, who was not an apostle. He also did it through the apostle Paul, who wasn't an apostle of the Lamb, but became an apostle on the road to Damascus while he was out doing the Lord's work, killing some Christians that day. <laughs> God can call you at any time. Amen. Okay. Instead, they healed the sick. Not once in the Gospels or the book of Acts does Jesus or the disciples ask God to heal someone while laying hands on them. Oh, Lord, if it be thy will. <laughs> Woo! Pray. To show up. Show up and show up. <laughs> you should have brought him with you. There it is. Why are you asking him to show up? Why didn't you ask him to show up in the prayer closet before you came? Woo. See, are we sent or are we those that just went? Mm. I know I've been both. I've been sent and the power of God's there under super grace. You go from Clark Kent to Superman under the anointing. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's been other times that I went... And I was like Clark Kent with some kryptonite around my neck. Okay? So I know both sides of this thing, and I've learned to wait upon the Lord, and He will renew the strength. And then I can be like, silver and gold have I none, but such as I have, give I thee in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And immediately strength comes into their ankle bones and they begin to walk and leap and praise God. And it becomes a sign or a wonder. It's a sign that points to something. And that something is Jesus. And it's a wonder that makes people go, wow, I wonder how that happened. And then you get an opportunity to share the gospel with them. It pricks the strings of their hearts. And they want to know more about your God. Because he's the God that shows up. When we do it the Bible way, we get Bible results. When we do it the church way, we get church results. Churchianity, I'm tired of those results. I want the kingdom of God, of Christ, and his kingdom of Christianity. Is there a difference? Amen? Amen. You know, churchianity, you're in the stands. 
You're watching the football game. Christianity, you're on the field crashing helmets, moving the chains and scoring some touchdowns, Ooh. putting irrevocable points upon the board for the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Yes. There's not a lot of people that get torn ligaments in the stands unless they're drinking too much. <laughs> okay? And I don't know that there's necessarily a reward for that. But when a player gets injured on the field, yes. the stands fall silent because they're concerned for their player. And that's at 150 a ticket. When we come to church and a minister gets injured or falls because the enemy's taking him out, we don't say, oh Lord, pray for him. We say, I told you so. I knew he wasn't real. Wow. We need to get the biblical standard where we walk side by side in unity. A yeah. fire devours before us and a fire behind us. And we do not break rank. And if one of us falls on the sword, we pray for him and they're not wounded. Look for the scriptural basis of that Joel chapter 2 army. Amen. In the B-I-B-L-E, the basic instructions before leaving earth. Have you read the instructions Lately, And if so, are you reading out of it what it says exegetically, or are you finding yourself having read into it what you already believe? It's time to allow the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit to change us from glory to glory and faith to faith as we're transformed into the image of His Son. You want to be a duplicate of Jesus? Yes. Begin to do what Jesus did. Won't you tarry with me just one hour in prayer? Oh, you fell asleep? Well, let me come back and get you. Let's go another hour. Oh, you fell asleep again? Holy Spirit wakes you up in the middle of the night to pray. Are you responding? Or are you pushing them away because you got a big day for Jesus tomorrow? <laughs> you got a ministry assignment. You need your sleep. Peter fell asleep three times, along with the other 11 disciples. But see, Peter was in for a test. Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus <laughs> overcame the cross in Gethsemane. He didn't overcome it on That's the cross. Right. That's right. He overcame it in prayer. Much prayer, much power, little prayer, little power, no prayer, no power. How much power do you have? I can tell you it's related to your prayer life. I know because it's related to mine when I'm powerless. Laying empty hands on empty heads, it's no good. Couldn't heal a flea of a headache one day. It's a prayer problem. It wasn't a headache problem. It was my lack of power because I lack a prayer. But Peter didn't pray on three separate night watch increments when the Son of God, God in the flesh, who was one with the Father and never did anything of His own, He only did that which the Father in heaven was doing, invited Peter to pray, and he fell asleep. Not once, not twice, but thrice. How many times did Peter deny Christ? Three times. What do you think would have happened had he prayed through those three times? When the cock crowed twice, I bet he would not have denied him thrice. Hallelujah. Revelation. But the good news is Jesus restored him, didn't he? Peter, do you love me? Feed my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? You know that I love you. Feed my sheep. He failed to pray three times. He denied him three times. And Jesus restored him three times. Spirit, soul, and body. Sometimes the first hour in prayer gets your flesh under. <laughs> the second hour in prayer will get your soul, your mind, and will, and emotions under. And the third hour in prayer will get your spirit to where it's revved up. You'll get from the outer courts to the inner courts into the Holy of Holies. And when you come out of the Holy of Holies, you may have started in the outer courts scared and frustrated. But when you come out of the Holy of Holies, you're bold as a lion. Instead of you having problems that you brought to God... By the time you get done, that third hour, you've got solutions for the problems. Amen. <laughs> we don't have a problem with God. We've got a problem with prayer. Amen. 
Yes. And when we can overcome that problem, all our other problems will line up. Because when you seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, all these other things will be added unto you. F.F. Bosworth said this, When a man wants what God wants, for the same reason that God wants it, nothing can stop them. When you want what God wants, for the same reason that God wants it, you're in alignment with the Father. Nothing can stop you. You might want what God wants, but you may want it for a different reason. God may want to prosper you, but you want the prosperity for the wrong reason, and you wonder why it's not happening. Thought to ponder. Okay. Not once in the Gospels or the book of Acts does Jesus or the disciples ask God to heal someone while laying hands on them. Instead, they prayed before they went to heal the sick. Said another way, they arrive on the scene, already prayed up, and then they simply speak healing commands. Now, we're going with the biblical model tonight, right? Yeah, that's right. Turn to your neighbor and say, exit Jesus. Okay, that's, that's, that, 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 that term, that's a theological term, it's not Greek, it's Latin actually I believe, and it means to read out of the scriptures what they already say. Okay? Exegesis. You've learned a term and you didn't even have to go to seminary. And you're going to leave with more faith from this service than I did from seminary. That's exciting, isn't it? Okay, and I went to a great seminary by the way, this Spiritual. Okay, instead they prayed before they healed the sick, said another way, they arrive on the scene already prayed up, and then they simply speak healing commands, exercising authority over the sickness, the disease, or the demons. Jesus had sickness over disease, demons, disease, demons, de-elements, de-elements, it's a joke, okay. Okay. This appears from the scriptures to be the key to release the already decided will of God into the matter, causing it to be what? Done in earth as it is in heaven. You want to know why we don't see more of heaven will, heaven's will done in the earth? We don't know what heaven's will is. We don't know how to come into agreement with him to release it. We are to be releasers. We cooperate with God. Without God, we cannot Without us, he will not. Say law, pause for reflection. Without God, we cannot. Without us, he will not. Surely the Lord God will do nothing in the earth without first revealing his secrets unto his servants, the prophets. Amos 3 7. What do the prophets do? They prophesy. Amen? Not a true question. So when God gives it to the prophets so that they can prophesy it, it's so he can bring it to pass. Do you see the cooperation? Jesus never did anything of his own, only that which he saw the Father in heaven. If Jesus was the express image of the Father. You want to know what God's will is? Read Jesus. Did he ever turn anybody down for healing? Just once, Matthew 15, the Syrophoenician woman, she was outside the covenant when she pressed the issue and worshipped and he healed anyway. People outside the faith seem to have more faith for healing. I'm in the marketplace all the time. I pray for non-believers and they get healed instantly. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I come to church, it's more difficult to get the believers healed. You know, we we have a tendency to be non-believing believers. And the non-believers happen to believe more about what we have faith in than we do. Truth be known, God heals the non-believer in his mercy to enable them to believe. And he loves the non-believer. He loves the prostitute. Hates prostitution. He loves the drug dealer. He hates the drug dealing. He loves the thief. He hates the thieving. Right? He loves the preacher. Okay. I don't know. I, I listen to some sermons. I, God's probably going, oh, where did he get that from? That's not in my Bible. <laughs> okay. We having fun tonight? Yeah. yeah. Nobody falling asleep? Okay, good, good. <laughs> this appears to be the key. 
Just as Jesus taught in our model of the Lord's Prayer for it to be done in earth as it is in heaven. You know the word in earth doesn't just mean in this atmospheric realm, it means in the earth and vessels. You know, this earth is going to burn up with the fervency of heat. But you don't have to. That's right. You and I don't have to, but some are going to. You know, we're either going to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant, or we're going to hear, well done, crispy critic, right? On that day. <laughs> you don't have to burn up. The earth is going to, it's an established fact, it won't be water, but fire next time, right? Right. The earthen vessels are what God wants to harvest out of the earth, the souls, the, that which God created, he wants to redeem. That's why he sent Jesus to die on the cross. He, as I often say, was hung up for your hang-ups and mine. That's why he was there. Are you releasing that unto other people? If you had the cure for cancer, would you hide it? You might have to from the FDA. Okay. So here's the point. If you had the cure for cancer, you would want to share it with your loved one who had cancer, wouldn't you? If not, you would be cruel. Sorry to hear you got cancer. Got the cure. Wouldn't that be terrible? Well, guess what? We know the cure. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Oh, but, but so-and-so didn't get hit. What, were you using the biblical model? Mm. Well, guess what? If there's questions that we can't answer tonight, he'll answer them in your private prayer time. Or how about this? How about he'll answer them when we get there because we don't know everything, do we? But in the meantime, without condemnation, let's press in deeper with God yes. to find out more information and see our rate of success increase. It's your job. Maybe you weren't that good at it when you started it. But now that you've done it, it's easy and you have a conversion rate, a success rate. You've got a workflow rate, don't you? What if you'd have quit the first day when you were struggling with those things? It's the same way with healing and deliverance. Right. The more we do it, the more successful we become at it. That's true. Okay. Okay. We practice daily what we really believe. Okay. In effect, these examples appear to show us how to properly release the will of God into the earth using the authority given to us through Jesus' name. It appears that Jesus and the disciples understood how to agree with heaven. The already decided will of heaven and simply release that. And thereby, it also appears that these men were able to accomplish this by hearing the Father's voice and walking in unison with the Holy Spirit. Walking with God comes by agreement. Amos 3.3 3 says, How can two walk together except they be 